The message this morning is entitled, The Search for Meaning. And we're going to be looking in our sermon series, God's Story, Our Story, at the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be looking in particular at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes is written by King Solomon, who was the son of David and Bathsheba. Ecclesiastes is part of what is called in the Old Testament the wisdom literature. The wisdom literature is com comprised of Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and Job because it's a collection of generational wisdom of how to navigate the difficulties of life. As I studied Ecclesiastes in particular this past week, it was very clear that this story is written by King Solomon as a way of repenting. He's repenting as he nears the end of his life. Some commentators have called Ecclesiastes the story of the Old Testament prodigal God. That King Solomon, we learn in other scriptures, seeks pleasure and seeks meaning and purpose in everything under the sun. And it's here in Ecclesiastes where he is admitting that this is a meaningless exercise, that this will lead you nowhere. And it's the prodigal son recognizing that the pleasures of this world, the riches of this world under the sun lead you nowhere. He uses that phrase in Ecclesiastes, under the sun, 29 times. And under the sun is synonymous with our fallen world. It's synonymous with a world that is under the curse, under sin. And so what Ecclesiastes does through King Solomon is it helps us recognize the realities of our broken world and how to navigate this broken world under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and then we'll skip ahead to chapter 3, verse 11. This is the word of God. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works, I built houses, I planted vineyards for myself, I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who went before me. Also my wisdom remained with me and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil and this was my reward for all my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done, the toil that I had expended in doing it and behold, all was vanity, a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Chapter 3, verse 11. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And the grass withers and the flower continues to fade, but not the word of our Lord. No, the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. Stephen Covey, in his classic, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, encourages the reader about halfway through the book to do what he calls the funeral exercise. And he literally asks the reader to close the book and attempt this exercise. And he says, imagine you've come to the end of your life. And if you can envision your own funeral, and who would speak for you at your funeral? 
what would you want them to say? Because more than likely, what you'd want them to say is what you value most. And what you would want them to say, your spouse, your children, your children's children, your friends, reveal what truly is a priority in life and what really is not a priority in life. You see, what Stephen Covey was attempting to do was what is known as beginning with the end in mind. And that's exactly what Solomon is doing here. He's beginning with the end in mind. King Solomon has got to the end of his life. He's looked at everything he's acquired. He's looked at his attempts to pursue meaning and pleasure and purpose in all things under the sun. And he comes to the sobering reality and conclusion that it's all meaningless. It's all chasing after the wind. He comes to the end of his life and he looks backwards and he says, everything I chased and everything I pursued in an attempt to find meaning and purpose in life was an exercise in futility. And what I want us to do briefly this morning by looking at Ecclesiastes 2, I want us to think for ourselves in our own pursuit in our lives for meaning and purpose, where can it be found? I want to look at three things briefly. I want us to look at the pursuit of meaning, the problem with finding meaning, and the promise of one day finding it. The pursuit, the problem, and the promise of meaning. The first thing I want to point out in Ecclesiastes 2 is in verses 1 through 8, Solomon goes to great lengths of explaining everything he's done in his life to pursue meaning and purpose. He reveals to us in verses 1 through 8 that I spared no expense. He uses language like whatever I put my eyes on, I got. Whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted to achieve, whatever I wanted to acquire, whatever I sensed as a pleasure of this world, it was at my disposal. And he goes through this to remind us that the pursuit of meaning and purpose is not something that started a hundred years ago, but that even the ancients struggled from the beginning of time, ever since the fall of man, we have been striving to pursue meaning and purpose in all things, as Solomon says, under the sun, a phrase that he uses 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. But look where he finds meaning and purpose in life. It's found in verse 1. He says, now I will turn to pleasure. You see, what Solomon does is he says, in order to find purpose and meaning in life, my pursuit of purpose started with pleasure. Why is that important? Because any life, whether it is Solomon's life or your life, that attempts to live their life as if God does not exist, any life that attempts to pursue purpose and meaning apart from God under the sun can only conclude that purpose and meaning must be found in subjective pleasure. You see, in a society and culture where you eliminate objective truth, when you eliminate an absolute being, an absolute morality, you are only left with subjective feelings and pleasure. That's the only place, Solomon said, where I could find purpose and meaning under the sun. And let's not fool ourselves that we continue with the same struggle today, but even greater has there been a time in our history, I've said this before, where we in our nation, in, for instance, have had more wealth at our disposal, more material pleasures, and we still cannot find the one thing that our heart desires, that longing for purpose and meaning. But we will spend billions upon billions of dollars every year in a vain attempt to find purpose and meaning. And just as Solomon pursued it, we will stop at nothing because our society says this, that the guiding principle of our life is what is best for me. And so we should not be shocked 
when we turn on the news, that we see the result of a self-absorbed culture like ours. We should not be surprised when we see 60 million babies aborted. We should not be surprised when we see school shooting after school shooting. We should not be surprised at the racial division in our nation because we are a self-absorbed people more than ever before. And this is the result, tragedy after tragedy. It is a tragic existence for the man or the woman who attempts to pursue meaning under the sun. The second thing that I want you to see is not only the pursuit of meaning in verses one through eight, but then eventually Solomon gets to the very sober reality in verses nine and 11, and this is the problem with meaning. The problem with finding meaning under the sun is that Solomon recognizes in verses 9, 10, and 11 that nothing can be gained, that there's nothing new under the sun. He uses this phrase, nothing to be gained. In chapter 1, he uses the phrase, nothing new under the sun. And then he concludes that it's all chasing after the wind. What is wind? Wind is nothing. It's a vapor. What Solomon is saying is the one thing you need, the one thing you're pursuing, you can never actually get. It's like grabbing onto wind. It can never be held. It can never be grasped. It is a vain exercise. It is an exercise that will lead to nowhere. And this is the problem that Solomon is revealing for you and me. He's saying, wake up this morning. Your attempts to pursue meaning and purpose under the sun is no better than like chasing after the wind, something that can never be attained, something that can never be captured. I heard a, a pastor this week, Harry Reeder from Briarwood Presbyterian, describe Ecclesiastes like cotton candy. The cotton candy is sweet for a moment, and then once you bite in, you realize it's really nothing at all that that is like the pleasures of this world, that is sin, that it is pleasurable for a moment, that is what is offered under the sin, under the sun, that it is pleasurable for a moment, but then you realize that you're really not eating anything at all. It simply vanishes away and dissolves away. It is a chasing after the wind. You see, Solomon here in chapter two is not trying to be pessimistic. He's not trying to be a Debbie Downer. He is trying to give you a wake-up call and says, this is the reality of life. Learn from my example. Learn from my exercises in futility of chasing after something that can never be grasped or attained. Nothing new. Nothing to be gained. Nothing new under the sun. Now, you could easily conclude by reading the entirety of Ecclesiastes that this is a book, no wonder why many preachers don't preach from it. No wonder it's not one of the first books we go to in our Bible study because you could easily read Ecclesiastes from beginning to end and say, I appreciate the realistic outlook on life, but where is the hope? Where's the gospel? Where is Jesus Christ in the midst of this sobering reality of life under the sun? And if you don't read it closely, you can miss it. But it was the last verse that we read together this morning. In chapter three, verse 11, it's where we find the promise in the midst of our vain pursuit of meaning, in the midst of understanding the problem with finding meaning under the sun, it's in verse 11 that we see the promise of meaning. And this is what Solomon says in verse 11, that God has put eternity in the hearts of man. What is he saying there? If you don't understand what he's saying, you'll miss the beautiful promise. In my opinion, verse 11 is the most profound verse in all of Ecclesiastes because it's the one verse that gives us hope. It's the one verse that gives us a possibility. It's the one verse of promise because what Solomon is saying is that you and I have been designed with an infinite void that nothing in this world could ever satisfy. You've been built for eternity. 
And your problem is you're searching for everything under the sun to find meaning and purpose, and your infinite void can only be satisfied and fulfilled by something above the sun. You see what Solomon is saying is he's pointing us in the midst of this world under the sun, he is pointing us to a world above the sun where true meaning and purpose can be found and the promise would be fulfilled, the promise of verse 11 of eternity being in our hearts, that we have a God-shaped hole in our heart and our soul that only something eternal, only something infinite can fulfill. That promise is one day satisfied in the person and work of Jesus Christ because it's in Jesus Christ that we see the infinite becoming like the finite. We see the son of eternity becoming like you and like me. We see the infinite God of the universe putting on flesh and coming into our finite world to save you and to save me. This is why Jesus himself is able to say in Luke chapter 11, verse 31, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. How in the world is Jesus greater than Solomon? Jesus is referring to that scene in 1 Kings where the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, comes to listen to and sit at the feet of King Solomon, who at the time was known as the wisest man who ever lived, and she was blown away by his wisdom. How then is Jesus greater than Solomon? It's because Solomon, in his wisdom, was only able to conclude that there is nothing new under the sun, but it would be Jesus, one who is greater than Solomon, who would announce at the end of time, behold, I make all things new. This is our Jesus, one greater than Solomon, a wisdom that comes from above the sun, the sun of heaven who comes down and makes all things new, not just in our world, but makes all things new in your life, so that he now becomes the one who makes all the difference. He now becomes the one that you stand amazed at, because he is the one who empties himself, the one who had every right to be self-absorbed, empties himself of all of his glory, so that you and I could be filled forever and ever. You see, the day you wake up and realize that you have been created for Christ and for him alone is the day that your life will forever be changed. Listen to me. You live your life under the sun, you will lose your life. But you live your life for the one above the sun and you will have eternal fulfillment both now and forever. You see, this is why the Apostle Paul was able to say in Philippians, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It's why Paul is able to say, my life is a win-win because I now understand that the true meaning, the true way that we find true meaning and purpose in life is not found under the sun, but it is in the Christ who emptied himself for me and for you so that I can live through this life and I can live in this world saying, as for me, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Listen to me, we live in a world, a world that is desperate for meaning and purpose. We live in a world that is desperate for hope. We live in a hopeless world and we, the people of God, have the one message that we are able to shout from the mountaintops to say this is where hope and purpose and meaning is found, not in the things of this world, not in the things under the sun, but in the one who is above the sun. And the pra practical application this week is so simple, and I want every single person here and everybody listening online to do it. I want you to answer this one 
statement. We have it for you. For me to live is blank. For me to live is blank. It might be the most practical and helpful exercise you do this week. If you're a parent or a grandparent, sit down with your children. But before you quickly answer that question and before you fill in that blank, I want you to think long and hard and really evaluate my life. As much as I want to say for me to live is Christ, I want you to ask yourself, is it? Is that really where I'm finding my hope? Is that really where I'm finding my purpose and meaning in life? That blank makes all the difference in the world. If it's anything smaller than Jesus, that is a tragic, tragic existence. A word to parents. The greatest thing you can do, moms and dads and grandparents, is to sit your children down as young as possible and look them in the eye and say, surrender early. That you will save yourself tremendous heartache and tragedy and pain in life by not looking to the things of this world, but by looking to Jesus. For all of our children and youth listening today, I think I speak for every adult in this room and every adult listening online when I say this, do not buy the lie of this world. Do not buy the lie of this culture. A world that can only promise and never deliver. Look to Jesus and turn to him. Do not buy the lie of a world that is self-absorbed. That's how you lose your life. You want a life? You look to Jesus. Michael was a little boy and he was mad. He was a mad little boy and he was at his sister's birthday party. And the reason he was mad, because naturally at a birthday party, you have presents and celebrations. And Michael just didn't understand why all of the presents and celebrations weren't for him. And so he pouted and he sulked all throughout the birthday party. How come nobody brought me a present? And how come nobody's giving me attention? And how come nobody's talking to me? And finally, the mom had enough. And she sits down little Michael and she turns him around and she says, listen, it's not your party. Listen to me this morning. Someone needs to get in your face and say, it's not your party. Life in this world is not about you. And the day you realize that, your life will never be the same. The world says, make life about you, and that is true freedom. That is a lie. The gospel tells us, no, true freedom is realized when you surrender your life to the one above the sun. To be set free. To be set free. To realize that my life is not about me, but Jesus came into this world to rescue me from me and emptied himself, even laid down his life on the cross. That whoever put their faith and trust in him will have life to the full both now and forever. There is no purpose, there is no meaning, there is no hope beyond the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you are here this morning and we're watching online and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I am pleading with you. Today is the day. Do not delay in surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, to being able to admit that Jesus, you are the one that has come and you are the one that I need, that I have been created for you and for you alone. Would you place your faith and trust in him today? The place of true freedom, the place of true hope, the place of true meaning and purpose. Turn to Jesus today and stand amazed and look to the one who emptied himself so you would forever be filled. Look to the one above the sun. So the funeral exercise, what's it going to look like for you? As for me, I can only hope by God's grace that they stand up and they don't talk about me, but they talk about the Christ that I served, that they don't talk about Rob, but they say, as for him, for him to live 
was Christ. And to die, it was all gain. How about you this morning?